Welcome, I'm Gary Parr, and you're listening to Fiber Talk, the twice-weekly podcast for needlework artists. Our artist this week is Helen McCook. Tremendous conversation with Helen. Going to get to that in just a minute, but first need to tell you about our two sponsors this week. Uh, the first one is the Embroiders Guild of America, and that is at egausa.org, where you can learn about a tremendous organization that is uh, full of education opportunities, outreach projects, you name it. Uh, Vaughn and I, as, as we've talked about several times, have uh, joined the EGA because when we looked through the website, we saw just a tremendous growth and opportunity there to expand our, our needlework experiences and encourage you to do the same. They have uh, online classes, free projects, uh, and as I've said before, be sure if you go to that gallery section, you have some time on your hands because you'll spend some time there, I guarantee you. Call your attention to two, pro, uh, two uh, events coming up here. One is a Brazil, beginning Brazilian dimensional embroidery with Judy Caruso, and that features the creation of a stitch sampler using many beginner-level dimensional stitches, including bullion and cast-on stitches. Registration ends August 31. And then the other one that I uh, would like you to take a look at is Hidden Trellises with Marilyn Hazelwood, in which you'll stitch the trellising background and use a variety of stitches to incorporate flowers, allowing both the trellis and the flowers to shine. Registration for that ends August 26. So a little bit of time to uh, get in on those things. And they're adding, they're adding things all the time at, uh, at the website there. So uh, just put that, bookmark that thing, EGA egausa.org. Bookmark that so that you can check in regularly and uh, give serious consideration to be a member. Uh, you, you don't have to join a local chapter either. You can do what Vaughn and I did and become a, a member at large and have all the benefits without um, uh, feeling obligated to go to a meeting, or maybe you just don't have a chapter in your area and want to be a member of an organization of, of uh, enthusiastic stitchers. So uh, try that route. Uh, it works for Ron and me. And then uh, whether you do a project from EGA or one of your own projects or just are looking for something new to stitch, be sure to uh, call Kim at Sassy Jack Stitchery. Kim will fix you up there, sassyjackstitchery.com. And uh, as we've talked about a thousand times here, we have the Royal Garden project coming up, Stitch Along. Kim offering 15% off those kits. And uh, July 5, we start that project with a live show at 2 o'clock Eastern Time. Kim, Vanna, and I will uh, uh, be stitching. And so if you're involved in that, want to do that, that uh, project, uh, get your kit if you don't already have it. Kim will get it out to you right away, and then you'll be able to join us on July 5 for a live show, and we'll be there to fumble and or help you. Fumble our own things and or help you. I'm not quite sure how that'll go. But anyway, you'll get help if you need help, or you can just enjoy stitching with us. Also, be sure and check out uh, Elizabeth Cooper, Jesus Wept, a sampler uh, Kim put together for the uh, quarantine period. That chart is free, and then, of course, she has kits available for that. And then if you've never done uh, Needlepoint, Counted Needlepoint, be sure and check out Kim's Boxed Heart Project, which is a beginner project designed by Carol Lake and Michael Boren. And Kim is doing videos to help you with that so you can get your feet wet before you dig into the Royal Garden. And then uh, uh, Kim is able now to open her store on a limited basis. So appointment shopping will begin July 1. So you have to call and, and she'll uh, let you know how the appointment uh, system works. She also is offering curbside service, and then shipping now is a $4 flat fee up to $50. Then it's free after that, and international is $15 flat fee. And then be sure to check out the Learning Stitches series. That is a tremendous series that you want to get involved in if you want to expand your stitching arsenal. And uh, if nothing else, get the book because the book is outstanding. So that's at sassyjackstitchery.com, and we appreciate Support from Embroiders Guild of America and Sassy Jacks for this show. And now we'll listen to Helen McCook. Helen McCook, thanks for joining us. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Oh, this is this is going to be fun. There isn't too much you haven't done. I'll say that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he's been varied. <laughs> yes. So word on the street is you got into this crazy world of needlework because a leaflet fell at your foot. 
Absolutely. Uh, um, yeah, kind of serendipity took a bit of a hand, I think. It's um, it's a funny one. I was at university and I was studying for a Bachelor of Arts degree um, in print and dyed textiles with non-European art history. And um, I'd been on work experience. I thought I was going to work using colour. I was going to work as a colourist um, for big printing companies and things. And um, so that was where my head was at. And I'd been on work experience uh, whilst at university with a big industrial company. And they were brilliant. But um, the amount of people that were turning around and saying to me after a few days of being there, you know, it's, it's a dying trade. It's, you know, everything's changing. You're not going to have a lifelong career. Um, and they were kind of you know, there was one person that took a good look at my face at that point and kind of realised what they were saying was having an impact. And they kind of <laughs> really, really kindly took the time to kind of sit down and go, let's have a cup of tea and have a conversation. Very British, let's have a cup of tea and a conversation. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so we sat down and had a chat about it. And they were like, OK, there's so many people coming out of university these days um, and people with very similar skill set. What is it about you that's going to make you the person that, is employed within a, a job market that's becoming it's reducing in size here in this particular field um and i just kind of said you, you know what that's a really good point um there's so many of us we've all got a lot of talent and skills and uh, you know it's uh, other than attitude and aptitude and desire for the job i mean with ten a penny there's a lot of us with the same uh, kind of qualifications so uh, you're right um there's not a lot to, to pick between us i wouldn't have thought and um and they kind of said, OK, so if you really, really want to go into textiles, then you really need to think about a niche skill that you can have or um, a niche market or another string to your bow. Um, and I really valued that chance to kind of have a, a chance to stop and kind of look at what I was doing. You know, you get on the treadmill, you've gone through yeah. school and college and university and you kind of like, da, 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 you know, it's one after the other and you kind of think you're on that path that you're going in and this gave me an opportunity to kind of stop and think about it and really think about what I wanted and what would please me and how I could make that a functional role um and so yeah it sounds like a really boring conversation I had with myself there but um, <laughs> it's um in kind of fate took a, a hand really so I went back to university to com continue with my degree which I wanted to complete and um and I went into the careers library and was pulling out some information. I was actually looking at, at that time, the Victorian Albert Museum in London had um, a textile conservation course that they used to teach. And I thought that that was potentially the direction that I wanted to go in. I pulled out some information um, regarding that and a leaflet dropped on my feet. And it was for the Royal School Needlework for the apprenticeship that they ran at the time. And... Um, I kind of picked it up and looked at it and thought, what's this? Um, and, I, you know, I, I didn't stitch, so I didn't have any knowledge of, of embroidery at all. Um, and I just kind of thought, I've never heard of this place. Hang on. Did a bit of homework. And I kind of looked into it and I thought, crikey, this sounds interesting. <laughs> so, um, I, yeah, I ended up having um, an interview, well, two interviews with them and got accepted onto the apprenticeship. So I was still in my third year at university. And I knew I was going straight into the apprenticeship course once I'd graduated. So that was another three years full time as an apprentice. And it was based at Hampton Court Palace. And it was just an incredible, incredible moment where you kind of your future just t takes a left turn. And um, and it completely molded my absolute obsession and fascination with uh, embroidered textiles from there. Um, so all from that one moment of of you know that that leaflet dropping on your feet so yeah <laughs> so so you got all the way through mm. three years of university yes. without any real of real formal needlework experience at all yeah so i mean when and, i was and little... then and then a leaflet mm -hmm. and then you go right into the yeah. royal school <laughs> Yes, bonkers, okay, that's a, that's a ride. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it was an experience for both both me and for the Royal School Needlework. I, I don't think they knew what they were taking on either, to be honest. But um, they, yeah, rather gamely took took me on board. And um, yeah, it was one of those things when I was little. My mom um, introduced me to cross stitch, you know, so I'd done like a little cross stitch kit or two. Nothing, nothing fancy. Um, and then not really experienced 
embroidery. Um, I'd done a bit of machine embroidery with textiles at, at secondary school. So I went between the age of 11 and 16. There was um, textiles that I did. But that was, you know, batik dyeing and, um, uh, you know, painting of materials, and machinery and, hand, and stitching in with machines. So it was not um, hand hand embellishment or anything like that. So um, it was when at university there was an embroidery module, but it was fabric manipulation. So it was very contemporary looking at how you manipulate fabrics. And I remember one particularly special evening ruining half of the kitchen utensils by branding fabrics with... <laughs> <laughs> branding fabrics with them but um, i'll bet uh, that made you popular the, the, the potato mash was never the same after that but um <laughs> yeah it was just this it was just this thing where I, I just had that moment where you see something i've always loved textiles like you know i was a very tactile child always had my fingers up everything had to see the world that way and explore the world through touch and and i just had that moment where i saw what they were doing and how they were doing it and I just thought it's just the stars are aligned but it's just one of those things that I just thought I, I know where I'm supposed to be mm. and I didn't know what it was going to take to do it or how likely was it they were going to take me or otherwise or you know I just didn't I didn't know about any of those things I just knew that if I didn't apply I'd regret it so yeah. um and it completely changed the course of my life ever since so in in in, in a marvelous way so yeah very very grateful for that uh, for fate taking a hand there so, okay two yeah. two conversations i have to know about mm. the, the one with your parents who thought you were about done with school and off to get a job <laughs> yes. and then i've never done needlework i'm at the royal school you should take me into your program yeah, well, I mean, let's. I mean, you're there. you're a salesman more than anything. I'm telling you right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the gift of the gab. Yeah, no, I. It was one of those things that um, I was very open and honest about the fact that um, you know, I with Kiara said that I'd never done stitching before. Um, and they used to take people for the apprenticeship that they'd they you'd come from different disciplines and backgrounds, and mostly people, of course, had done embroidery of some kind um but i took my portfolio of design work and i was like this is my background uh i mean they're, they're clever the way that they could train monkeys the way that they they, <laughs> they train things it, the way that they do it is just a well programmed format it's just it's been considered over time and changed over time and continues to still be tweaked and changed here and there to to make it the best possible course within the current circumstances and i think it's um fascinating that they can do that and that the, we we as an organization because i still work with them um adapt in that way within such a traditional field mm -hmm. to try and make it contemporary to the modern setting but it was that thing where you know they knew that my background was not stitched they knew that they would give me those skills and i was a complete blank slate as that as far as that was concerned and and it was a massive learning curve i didn't even know what finger thimbles went on um <laughs> in fact i went you you were given a list of things to take with you as an apprentice on your first day and thimbles was one of the things on the list and i took i went to a to a I was going on a day trip with my mom and there was a an embroidery shop nearby to the place that we were going to and I'd taken my list with me, knowing this, and we went in. And my mom, again, we didn't think we knew anybody who was interested in embroidery, so she was trying this title out for the first time. She said, my daughter's got into the Wolfsburg Needlework Apprenticeship Scheme. And she's got a list of things, and the lady was like, oh, interesting, very good. Um, and I knew nothing about what anything was for or where anything <laughs> went, and it was just completely... So you're just no faking your way through it. <laughs> just smiling at her like you know we need help <laughs> and um and she brought out this box of what looked like a thermidor you know like for, for cigars mm -hmm. and I, I, like a, a um a humidor sorry and um and i was like interesting what's this and then she'd got out this very shiny array of differently sized thimbles and i was i'd never seen anything like this before so i was like that's very interesting because <laughs> i've got very small fingers so um she, we managed to find what i thought was the right thimbles and the lady in the shop looked at me and went that might be that might fit but they're the wrong fingers dear and i could see her <laughs> thinking well, i thought it was a bit mean that she'd let me try them on on the wrong fingers in the first place but um 
you know, um, I did see her thinking, you know, keep the receipt because you'll be bringing those back. Right. You know, um, but it was it was one of those things. I, I always remember it with good humor because it's that thing you have to remember where you've come from and how far you've come. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, you know, it doesn't matter what you work on. We're all coming from the same place. So it's it's such an important lesson to remember and to try to be retain your sense of humor and mm. to be a bit humble about it because <laughs> you know we've all had that moment where we've really kind of not known anything but just really wanted to do something um so that and that's the important thing wanting to do something so right. you know the will to do it but as far as my parents were concerned it was you know i always say that i kind of won the life lottery with my parents because my family were very they're very competitive people they're always involved with sports and athletics particularly which is how my parents met so um they both came from working class backgrounds and worked really hard for everything they'd got and everything they gave us and and it was that thing where they you know always said get a job you'll enjoy because you'll do it a long time and it's a long time to get out of bed every day dreading the day but i think they they also said train train for a role i think they were thinking you know doctor lawyer right, you know, right, right. teacher something <laughs> like that you know so something with having, a real job <laughs> yeah so that lovely title but um i think it's that thing where you know because that was their experience they were you know and they always wanted to be so helpful because they wanted to you know if you said you were interested in something they they kind of think of somebody they knew that did that or or had an interest in that that could maybe advise you and kind of pass on that knowledge and they were always very kind of like community was very important to, to my family um and particularly my dad and so he'd always think how can we help that person mm-hmm. achieve what they want to achieve and and that was the way that we were raised so it was um quite important for them to be able to assist us so i think one of their main concerns was not the fact that i was going to be studying for another three years um i think it was well, where will that lead to what will you do with that is there a job at the end of it um how can we help you? Because we don't know anybody that does this. Is this a job? Um, <laughs> yeah, key, you know, all, key question. All completely normal questions, you know. And, and you know, when you're in that moment, you're in that excitement of a new revelation. You're kind of, um, you know, you don't think about those things. You're kind of just so right. blinkers on. So it's very important that somebody's going to stand there and go, okay, can we, can, can we just <laughs> sit and think about this for a little bit? So it was really funny because when... Um, I went for my two interviews. My my parents came with me, and um, and it was really funny because after the first interview, I came out and they, the first interview was really interesting because it was with the principal who was Elizabeth Elvin at the time, and she had the interview with you. And if you weren't going to get a second interview, you got shown the door. But if you were going to have a second interview, then they'd show you. She'd show you round. And then oh. she'd show you she'd show you around and you'd get a chance to chat some of the apprentices and ask you questions of them. And then um, and she'd take you downstairs and then say, OK, you've seen what we do. You've seen how we do it. Have a think for a week. And if you'd like the second interview that I'm offering you, then let us know. But if it's not for you, it's not for everybody. But if it's not for you, then just let us know. Um, and I came out of that interview thinking, I want the second interview Hmm. and I went and spoke to my parents and they were like okay so what happens now and I was like I've got a second interview and they were like oh okay um so I came to a second interview and they were like so what happens now (laughs) and um and I was like well I'll wait and hear if I've got the place and if I've got the place then I go at the end of August start of September and I'm here for three years full-time and that's it you know so we we see what happens I, I work I work like stink and get get my apprenticeship so um so it was really funny because they were kind of like, OK, then. And then when I got my letter, actually, my letter arrived on my birthday, which was they'd said so that was, <laughs> the RSM made me laugh because they said that they wouldn't send a letter out to let us know what whether we'd got a place or not until after Christmas so that we wouldn't um, have a ruined Christmas if we didn't get in. <laughs> <laughs> but I actually got my letter on the 21st of December, which is my birthday. So it was the best possible birthday present that year. So um so I got my place and my parents most of the people's parents that I've spoken to their parents were kind of like oh my goodness it's amazing you've got a place and my parents were like right are you sure you want to go <laughs> <laughs> so, so and but the thing was it was this amazing journey for all of us really because um you know I I 
Estonian I think about embroidery either and I went and took this place up and which they were concerned about you know because they were concerned about the outcome of what it would mean and how it would you know this extra three years of study would affect my my life and um and going away from home and all of these things normal parent worries and right. um and it was really lovely because actually because they're they're the way that they are and they're very interested and engaged with what all of us do um they they learnt about embroidery as well so i'd quite often um there's very good fabric markets and things in birmingham where i'm from so i'd send um i'd, I'd speak to my mom on the telephone and say mom i need some silk dupe on it needs to be like a a peacock blue and she'd go with my nan to the to the fabric market and <laughs> send fabric in the post and and it was just a wider range than i could afford to purchase through the normal shops at that point as an apprentice you weren't well paid so it was you know it was a fantastic opportunity but they would then go and get fabric for me and send it and they were engaged with that and it was it was lovely so it was a learning curve for all of us but especially for me <laughs> so uh, well now that must have been two two aspects of going to the royal school mm. as an apprentice who has never done anything is you're a blank slate so there's no bad habits to correct absolutely but on the other side that's a tremendous amount of work to effectively get up to speed i would think uh, yeah, um, I I think it's one of those things I've always been, as I say, quite competitive. So I've decided, you know, we always in our family, if you decide you're going to do something, you're going to do it. I'm, I'm very much like a light switch. I'm either interested or disinterested. So <laughs> um, so once you've switched your interest onto something, it's, you've got the laser beam of that interest. Um, so it, it was surely, I, it was a lot of work um, and it's, you're only going to allow it to intimidate you if you're going to say it's too much for yourself. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? But if you're going to accept the challenge, you're going to take it full on. And as I say, I didn't know what it was going to take to do it. I just knew I was going to do it. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, so it was that thing about, you know, it was great so far as learning to stitch with both hands was no more abnormal for me than stitching with one because I didn't stitch with one hand, let alone two hands. Right. So uh, learning to stitch with thimbles was no more abnormal because I didn't stitch. Um, so it was fantastic in so far as that for me, I was learning the, you know, not so much the correct way, but the RSN way of doing it um, was the way that the only way that I knew. So it's afterwards that you start to experiment and, you know, so I learned the technically correct way of doing things. Or the, the way that the RSN does it is there's lots of ways of doing things. Um, but I always say that the way that the RSN teaches and the RSN technique is the most efficient way of being able to replicate something to the same standard again and again. Mm -hmm. So um, there's a reason for the, for the way that we teach each stitch and the way that we do. And you can explain what that reason is and why. And for me, knowing why you were doing things in a particular way always helped me remember how to do it. Yeah. So um, so the fact that there's reasons for everything and you understand that. And and then it's just, is my stitch length too long? Is it too short? Is it is my tension correct? So there's a, it's a process. So um, it, you just have to be willing to apply yourself and put the work in. So, And I was really lucky because the year the year that I was in was an exceptional year. Um, you know, so I had um, a really good year and the girl that used to sit next to me um, in uh, in my first year was um, a lady called Emi Nimura, who is um, she works in Japan. She's from Japan. She came over from Japan. She was a Japanese. She was a professional bead embroiderer with books published before she came to the RSN. <laughs> so wow. for me, having her next to me meant that my bar was very high. Yes, um, because the she she set the standard um and so for me i was i used to come in initially i'd come in and i'd be you know you'd have your full working day at the rsn and then you'd go home make your dinner do your shopping do the normal things that you need to do domesticated things and then you'd sit for another four five six hours at night doing your homework getting through some more stuff and um and then I'd come in the next day feeling really pleased with myself thinking yeah i've achieved something last night that's really good i've moved this forward and i'd look at hers and i'd think it's like she's got pic it's like she's got pixies working through the night. It's 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 just like, it's like she's got an embroidery team in a in a apartment. And and I didn't I genuinely didn't know how she was doing it, but obviously the more familiar you become with something, the quicker you become and the more confident you become and it's about 
time spent on something, isn't it? So um, your, famili- your familiarity and therefore your speed increases. So, and for me, that was actually really, I, I know that for some people it would have been quite demoralising, but for me, I kind of thought, okay, well, I know what I'm shooting at. Yeah. It's, you know, when you run a race, I always think like when you run a race, it's easier to run quicker when you've got somebody to chase. Um, and that's how I applied myself to embroidery which sounds sounds really tactical and it wasn't like that at all it was we all got on very very well we in fact i'm i'm really good friends with pretty much everybody who was in my year um but it, as i say i it just really helped me to have that that high bar and that that um ability to look at pretty much anybody in my year and kind of go okay that's great what can i learn from that what can i how can i move this forward how's that gonna how can i apply that to what i'm doing yeah. and and that was brilliant for me so yeah well, in, in those kinds of situations, those mm-hmm. mental games are what gets you through it. Uh, you know, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to chase the person ahead of me. Of course, choosing a highly skilled Japanese needleworker is <laughs> – <laughs> I'm not so sure if that's the smartest move. But <laughs> well, you know. If, I, I, <laughs> if you measure child, up, to, you know. <laughs> yeah. As a child, I used to do cross-country running. As a teenager, I used to do cross-country running for quite a high-level – athletics club and you used to work your way picking your way through the field like okay i'm i'm chasing that person and the next person the next person and um and then you look at the end game and you think okay well what how did i do against my personal best how was my speed like compared to the last time i did this this distance and Mm -hmm. it's the same thing i mean emmy sat next to me so she was the person who i was looking at the most do you know so what she was working on and how she was working was the most familiar to me Mm -hmm. so um but then i also shared a house with um a really skilled embroiderer called jen goodwin as well who was in my year and and she we we're the best of mates even now and and it's it's brilliant because we'd kind of compare things and they'd be i'd kind of be sitting there at night working on saying can i be like i haven't got a clue what i'm doing i'd knock on a door and go jen like can you remember how to do this? Or I've completely lost myself on that. Or she did the same. And, and we kind of bounce off each other. And it was just, it was just such a brilliant process. And as I say, you were just engaged with it, absolutely immersed in it 24 yeah. seven. And I think it was completely necessary to be like that because it just embedded um, the absolute love of it. You know, it's going to either make or break you to, to live that life. It's like an endurance camp for three years. Right. And, um, and and for me, it completely embedded that obsession. Um, yeah. Yeah, because that, that's the exactly uh, what was going through my mind is in that situation, you either go left or right. And, oh, yeah. and left is out <laughs> the door. I can't do, I can't stand this. Or you yeah. just bury yourself and it becomes part of you. Yeah, I mean, it it completely, um, I, I always think it's a bit like a stick of rock. If you cut me through the middle, in, then you'll you'll see embroidery kind of <laughs> through the core. <laughs> it's, um, yeah, there's probably um, some threads running through there, but it's, um, it, it is. I mean, it, but it's so essential because to be able to work in this field professionally in whatever aspect, that you, there's so many directions you can take it in, to be prepped for that through one course, to be able to kind of, be prepared and, and be ready to go out and face those challenges in whatever field part of the field that is that's a massive thing to do and you have to work like stink to, to, to get there and, and mentally you are going to if you're working in a studio for example and you're working on commissions you're potentially going to be working very very long hours you're going to potentially be sleep deprived at times depending on the job and time that you've got you're going to have to work you know those those conditions don't make you a very pleasant you know person you know you can't, right. you start to get crotchety so you have to be able to work with other people effectively within that field and be able to work in a way that's acceptable you know so it's it's all of those things it's about training yourself to a point where you can be professional and you can approach things still be yourself but still bring something to the team that's the flavor of you but also be able to work within those conditions and i think you know you have to have a realistic um outlook you have to be able to have an insight into that job and go is this for me am i going to be able to you know and you're charging it as, as a professional embroiderer who's working on you know in a studio for example you're working by the hour you know so mm-hmm. if you're very slow um or take a time to ponder every stitch that you put in then you're not going to be commercially viable compared to the person somebody else that could do it so it you have to it has to be, have a brutal reality to it 
you know yeah um you know for you to be able to know you can do it as a job or what part of it you want to take forward as a job whether it's the teaching side whether it's the stitching side whether it's the designing and making new things is it kits there's so many things to do but you have to have the ability to have that honest response Mm. both from somebody else and from yourself because you know you have to be able to honest be honest with yourself about what you can can do and want to do you know so yeah it was it is that yeah you're right it's that you'd have that crossroads moment where you're like this is this is for me this is 100 percent where i'm going or no this is this is 100 percent not for me i've enjoyed it but no <laughs> time time time's done yep so. yeah and yeah and you, you best make the right decision there because um uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah i think so so but then, it, was, it was very much um, set in the fire, isn't it? You're molded in the fire. You're kind of like, if right. you can experience that and come out with with a love of it and still want to do it, you're gonna, nothing's going to be as hard as that. Oh, yeah. There's so. no question about that. Yeah. <laughs> if you still love it after that, yep. Yeah. You're good. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So what's the, what's the transition now uh, after you finish your schooling there? Uh, you stayed on and, and uh, taught. Yeah, so. what, what, how did you transition out of that? Um, well, I've always taught for the RSN. I really feel passionately about that. Um, I've taught for the RSN and for other places. Um, and I really, you know, did, because of the opportunity that they gave me to learn, I want other people to be, to be able to have that enjoyment, to have those mm-hmm. skills at their fingertips and to understand all the different aspects that you can give you, whether even if they're only learning one aspect, whether it's relaxation or mindfulness or whether it's, you know, the joy of seeing something being created. I love that. And passing on those skills is so important. So for me, I always love that. I love spending time with people uh, and getting those skills out there and sharing that with people, regardless of age, background, whatever, whatever they want to do with it. I want I want them to know it. Um, and so, yeah, so that was really important. So I always did that with the RSN and other places. Um, but when I finished my apprenticeship, when I graduated, um, I was just aware that you know, you could apply to stay at the studio and work in the studio as an embroidery stitcher um, within the studio. But I didn't do that because I was aware that it was a very safe environment. But at that time, if you were an embroidery stitcher, you weren't involved in the pricing or the quoting or for any of that side of it. So I knew that there was a lot that I didn't know. And I knew that at that point I'd got no responsibilities. And it was that, that thing, I don't know what I don't know. You have to go and try it to find out what you need to learn so I decided at that point to go freelance to get a normal part-time job to pay, pay some bills and to go and see what I didn't know um, this is, so this is the of, part where your parents are cheering loudly <laughs> bless them bless them they they, they actually because I said I was going to be going back home I was they were actually I we always used to joke I was a boomerang baby, but, you know, I was very fortunate to get on with my family very well. So they kind of like they always had an open door policy and they were like, as long as we can see you're working as hard as you can at what you want to be, we'll support you. As soon as you're dossing around, you you that's where we start to cut the right. line, cut the support line. And um, and that's I think that's so important because I think they got things that they had would have liked to do when they were younger and they financially their situation was not uh it was not able to support that so for them they they wanted to be able to support their kids to be able to chase their dreams as long as they were working you know as long as they weren't pie in the sky i mean as long as they were like as long as you weren't like i'd like to be an astronaut tomorrow um (laughs) you know it was it needed to be realistic and you needed to be able to show them that that you'd got a plan that you were working towards something and that you're working hard whilst they could see that within reason they'd support you mm-hmm. so so yeah so i came home got a normal job i was working um in a shop and um they did the rotors every week so i'd just be able to say okay next week i'm available i'm not available wednesday but i'm available the other days or however many days i got freelance work doing embroidery i could tell them and um and they were really great because they were like well as long as you're here and doing your job you know 100 percent when you're here we don't mind what you're doing all the rest of the time <laughs> so um so yes yeah, so i went off and i was doing freelancing and i was doing teaching and making and designing some kits and doing all sorts of things and doing some embroidery uh, commissions and um and it was during that period that i got approached i'd been, been freelance about 10 months and i got approached by an auction house big international auction house called bonhams um and I'd spoken to them about whether they needed any kind of whether any clients needed any restoration or conservation um, work, and um, they kind of contacted me and said, 
yeah, we can do that. But did you know we've got this post available at the moment and we think you'd actually be, you'd, you might be quite a good fit for it. So they kind of, I had a conversation with them and it was the funniest job interview ever <laughs> because they were kind of like, okay, tell, tell us why you'd be perfect for the post of head of textiles and costume. And I was like, I haven't got a clue. I've never been to an auction house before. I was never been to an auction, never been to an auction house. It's not a job I applied for. You told me about this job. <laughs> what is the job? You know, tell me what the job <laughs> is. What does it entail? So it, it, it turned into this really funny interview. And um, and in the end, we had this brilliant conversation. And I never forget, it was a lovely man called Robert Bleasdale, who I'm still friends with. He runs brilliant sewing tool sales, um, Bleasdale's auctions and, um, and antique sewing tools and um, we had this brilliant conversation and he took so much time and care to be able to explain it to me and and took me under his wing really and and really made me um open my eyes to that side of things so I'd got a lot of skills and knowledge already Mm -hmm. that did make me well suited for the job but I really needed to learn how to um separate the amount of time and care somebody had taken into something away from how to price something to the current market value or auction and things, how to do probate valuations, all these kind of things. So, um, so yeah, so he, he very kindly took me under his wing and taught me um, some of those things. And so I found myself in a department of an auction house um, describing and valuing cataloging and um, organizing um, catalogs for sales for textiles and costume. Hmm. And then um doing telephone bids and all of those types of things after sales and um and then um well that's things a, that I didn't that's a know that's about. an interesting mental process there knowing yeah. embroidery as you did at that point and what goes yeah. into it but then what is its market value yeah i think it was really interesting um it was a, again it was a bit of an interesting segue off the off the main event for me yeah. so it kind of I, it, it was something that an opportunity that came forward that I thought, well, I hadn't considered this before. Again, it's that process of loving to learn. I, I could see how it related really strongly to my field and being able to see these antique textiles every day and to see these amazing collections um, and to really learn about my field in a different way. And yeah. so it was a completely different sidestep. So it took me down a path that I hadn't expected really, really enjoyed it. And, um, and as I say, one of the amazing things was that if I, there were there were lots of things in this department so lace making and all sorts of things came under the department fans and you know chinese textiles things that are very specialized that i knew nothing about so i had consultants that i could then bring in to consult about these particular things that would come in and so i was learning with them they were very generous with their knowledge with teaching me about things and what to look for and and um and so I just it was just a really good period of learning for me as well so a uh, great opportunity and I, I went into it and as I say I think I kind of I spent kind of three four years there and um, really kind of enjoyed it but also was getting really itchy fingers towards the end to be making again because I was mm-hmm. seeing these amazing things and I'd be so inspired <laughs> and then because it was a full-time job and I was traveling around for it and all sorts um, you didn't have the energy at the end of the day to apply yourself to making designing the way that you would have wanted to so yeah, yeah. to have an outpouring for that creativity so um in the end um i dealt with a big record breaking sale um there was an export ban on it there was all sorts of things and i thought things aren't going to you know the the beauty about this field is that it's you age like a fine wine the more that you know the more value you will you become so sure, sure. um but having said that I just really felt strongly that I needed to go back into the making sector. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I kind of took a rather brave choice and leapt into being an atelier (laughs) manager. So I, I became atelier manager of hand and lock in central London. Mm. And, um, and so I was running their studios, which dealt with the theater and fashion and film and one-off commissions and things. And, um, so yeah, so it was complete leap into a different field because having gone from, um the auction house where you were dealing with the price the the perceived value of something um including its age over time and the kind of collector's market the trends in the collector's market of what was attractive and what was collectible and why mm-hmm. um you were then moving into having to 
estimate for jobs based on how long it's going to take again you know all the different facets of of making a process the prices involved with that the materials the threads and profit and and quoting for that training the team if there was things that we needed to look at skills wise you know okay what can i teach that person what can that person teach this other person how do we keep those skills up and checking that we were, we were maintaining targets on time within the workroom and quality within the workroom so it was a completely different set of challenges so yeah completely completely um fascinating alteration again so but this this path that you've taken learning mm. learning needlework and then uh, appraising and, and determining market value and then doing this uh, mm. really gives you all the aspects uh, that you need for what you're doing today. Yeah, I mean, without knowing it, I was kind of like right. building quite a full repertoire of knowledge. And, um, and it enabled me, having been at Hand and Lock, I think just over a year, I kind of I'd had some personal life changes and I thought okay where do I want to be what do I want to be doing how do I want to spend my time mm -hmm. and I realized that actually my aim eventually had always been to go freelance to be able to pursue all the different facets that interested me the most um so I had learned what I felt I needed to learn to be able to do that properly so the first time I'd been freelance it was kind of testing your teeth to see what you didn't know to see what you needed to know sure um seeing it what you needed to learn and what skills you needed to pick up by this point i felt this was 2008 and i felt like i'd got sufficient skills to be able to go freelance with the confidence and knowledge of being able to feel like i could support that uh properly you know i had i had different skills to, to those which i came out of the rsn with and i felt like um i had a different approach and outlook entirely um so i kind of added to those skills and felt like i was ready for that so um so yeah and, and now it's really interesting because you know all the different facets that i find interesting people always find it really strange that you know i'm interested in the history and research of it i'm interested in the make technical making skills i'm interested in the teaching and they find them quite disparate but to me they all link to together really strongly so um again as i say i find I love to spend my time with people and talking to people and finding out about how they respond to embroidery and, and what they want to do with it and where they want to take it and teaching them those skills. But then I also really love to spend time in a solitary manner designing, you know, getting completely immersed in the stitching process. So um, to me, it's a really good balance of those things and aspects that I need to pursue and the things that I need out of a job. So You, yeah. you find equal satisfaction in both? yeah absolutely i think for me it's very much yin and yang you need the balance i need the balance of that so i couldn't spend my time 24 7 in people's company um but then i couldn't be on my own 24 7 either um it's that it's that thing about needing both aspects to feel like a complete circle um so for me it all really balances itself off and um it, it gives me everything that I need from a job. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's really important. So when it comes to design time, complete immersion, like shut the world mm. out? Yeah, I mean, um, I really enjoy that process where you can kind of get your head into that. Like, So designing was one of my first loves, really, because I think it's, you know, the way that you see the world, but your brain playing your brain playing with the way that you see the world so mm -hmm. you know um i love i love to design so for me it's quite a straightforward process i really enjoy immersing myself into it and i you know it comes quite easily to me because i've got that background and i've trained in it and i love it um and i feel very comfortable with it but um it's sometimes the challenge is more than anything because things feel complete in your head so you can imagine quite i can, can imagine quite in a quite a full manner once i've got an outline on paper i can imagine what the colors are going to be like i can imagine what the texture is going to be like so for me the challenge is sometimes to make sure that i push through to the completion point where it actually is finished in fabric <laughs> because because it's in me, your it's head really so you're good to go yeah. to me it's a really beautiful thing so sometimes you have to think no actually this needs to be <laughs> out in the world rather than just in on the inner on the inner world it's um sometimes that's the challenge because um as i say um 
retaining your interest all the way through to the completion of of that project um because as i say the 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 inner world's quite beautiful already (laughs) (laughs) it's perfect folks trust me if you could just see it (laughs) (laughs) yeah exactly but i think as well it's that thing about um about knowing why you're doing something as well because you know i'll quite often pursue within classes that i teach or kits that i create i'll quite often pursue things that i'm interested in or techniques that i'm i've I've taken my attention at that particular time so that's really good because it gives me a purpose to make that a finished thing in the outer world whereas um sometimes as say the the perceived thing in the inner world in your brain um you think okay do what do i need to to share that with people you know because as i say it's that you know how much of it is because it is a job and you're wanting to earn money or you're wanting to please somebody or it's for a particular thing for somebody or a commission and how much of it is just something that you've imagined that's that's pleased you in Mm. that in that moment so i think um as i say some of it some of it i'll just come up with stuff and i'll start doodling and i'll be like oh that's really nice and i'll I'll kind of like play with that and then i mean i've got a drawer full of drawers full of designs that will never ever be completed you know because you can't complete everything because embroidery is you know in relative terms slow designing is quick so it's one of those things that um i'm really fortunate because i've got a couple of people who very very kindly actually have volunteered to stitch a few things because we had this conversation a while ago and they were like that's such a shame these things need to be out there and i'm like <laughs> i can't i can't i've not got time to stitch everything that right. i imagine so you have to be choosy about what you're putting out so um so yeah so i've now got a couple of people who've kind of gone okay some of the things that you um enjoy that you maybe wouldn't have stitched initially like send me some pictures or send me a stitch plan or you know so um so yeah so i've got a couple of ladies who do that which is really pleasing because actually sometimes you do get surprised because you think oh you know how i imagined it sometimes the way they interpret a stitch plan might be slightly different so Mm -hmm or the slight colour variations or shade variations that they put in. So it's so I'll get these pieces back and it'll just be a beautiful surprise. And um <laughs> and it's and it's it's lovely because actually, you know, it's that moment where you can disengage yourself Great. from the initial design and the design process and because somebody else has stitched it, um, you kind of have that moment where it's a surprise when you open the box and you're kind of like oh okay so you see it with fresh eyes right so, exactly yeah um, yeah whereas when you're stitching it yourself you become so immersed in it you almost become snow blind to a to a point mm-hmm. um because you you it's that point at which your imagination and your reality merge so how much of it i think sometimes when people stitch sometimes you miss things because you know if you miss mistakes or whatever else because um your imagination has, has smoothed over those because right. you're, you know what you imagine it's going to be like. Exactly. So yeah. Yeah. Um, that's why it's always sometimes good with designs. You know, I always put them put them up. If, I'm, if there's something that I kind of think, uh, I'm not sure if that's finished, I kind of put it up and I'll live with it for a little while. I'll put it on the wall or I'll put it upside down so I can kind of think about it in a set of shapes rather than the ideas that I had imagined originally. So um, if it works as a set of shapes, then it's it's finished. Yeah. So it's it's interesting to me to hear you describe that because as mm-hmm. as a magazine editor, mm-hmm. I affect it w- when I'm editing a piece, you know, and there's a very distinct difference between a writer and an editor. And yes, uh, when I edit a piece, that's my standard practice is I'll mm-hmm. I'll edit it, go through it a couple of times, and then it it goes away. Uh, I mean, in the pressures of deadlines force it to go away for no more than a day. Mm. but it's all right i think that's finished but i need yeah. i need to come back to it with fresher eyes and a fresher head yeah. and yeah. So, yeah so you set it aside and then later on you come back and that's when you see the other things exactly that, that, yeah that your mind is glossed over right yeah, yeah exactly exactly the same yeah. so and yeah you I need that, that you need that process and that's what gets you closer to the end product yes yeah, I always say that when I'm teaching as well, you know, when people have spent a long time stitching something, they become so enmeshed with it. It's um, really fascinating when you can have that moment where you kind of go, OK, you know, I would say we like canvas work, for example, you'll have a day where you'll kind of like we call it hedgehog day. So we'll 
where I'll be sitting there literally putting pins in where they've missed a stitch. And they'll be like, <laughs> I don't think there's any. I've, I've, I've stitched all of it. It's, it's all covered. And you'll be like, uh-huh, okay. Well, let me just take a look, real good close look at it. So I'll sit down with a box of pins and then you'll kind of be like, you know, an assortment of pins all over the place. And I'll be like, how have I missed all of these stitches? And like, because you weren't looking for them. Right. You know, to you, it's completed. And that's how it, how it should be. Like, But you need that that eye to just scan it to make sure that you have you know covered it all that it's all looked completely smooth that there's no drops and um and and it's really interesting you know i think it's it's a perfect example of that so yeah hedgehog day i love that mm, okay hedgehog day <laughs> <laughs> oh no i'm awful start over <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah well i think it's that thing because we um I always kind of like share examples of things where I, when I first started and because it was such a steep learning curve for me, there were things that I kind of misunderstood or dropped the ball on or whatever else. And, and that, that was just another challenge to kind of come past, but I always kind of joke with my students about those moments. And, um, and because I think sometimes people think that you come out, of, you, you go into the RSN you know, fully spawned as an embroiderer and you just go out as a better version of, of that. <laughs> and, um, and of course, that isn't the case. It wasn't the case for me, certainly. And, and I think it's it's really good for people to know that process and to be able to share those stories and to know that that's normal. So, yeah. So what does your business look like today? What I mean, it's multifaceted. There's no question. What uh, what all it goes on in you know, a yeah, month's I mean, period of time. There's no standard day, which is good. I mean, obviously in lockdown, it's weird, but normally in normal life, um, there's no standard day. I mean, I spend about a week and a half of every month normally in Scotland um, teaching and lecturing. So um, I teach in a sort of places. So I work for the Royal School of Needlework. I'm in the Scottish branch up there from Glasgow from the art club. Um, I teach for the Weem School of Needlework. I work with the Royal Collection at Holyrood Palace in Edinburgh, which is, uh, you know, an amazing opportunity. So I try and meet as wide and varied a group of people as possible um, and engage with the heritage that I love, you know. So for me, things like um, working at the portrait galleries or working at the National Gallery or working at Holyrood, it's because it's in that setting where you can see historic artifacts where you can see historic textiles or you can see representations of them in portraits so for me it really gives it that lovely full circle to be able to see things in context mm -hmm. um, and to share that context with people but um so that that's kind of a week and a half to week to week of every month um i spend a lot of time designing and making new kits um whether that's for classes or whether that's for retail um i um as i say i spend a lot of time I, I do also do restoration aspects of conservation um for people so i do i do some of those so commissions come in for that and then uh commissions also for theater film um one-off bespoke pieces for people that they want to have so yeah but i think also kind of building a lot of um building a lot of questions so people kind of like the more you kind of out there the more people kind of use you as a sounding post mm -hmm. so it's kind of like asking advice on threads or fabrics or you know so there's some of that goes on as well so yeah it's a real mixture and um i've been doing some um work with trying to develop some things with children at the moment so um during lockdown one of the things that i've been doing is um thinking about how children respond to embroidery or how they would respond to embroidery so i've been kind of developing some things that i want to do as as lockdown eases here so um i've been thinking about that a lot mm. as well so how we kind of get what i love to the next generation so i've i've always done stuff in schools and special projects in schools but trying to get an engagement um with people outside of a school setting um children outside of a school setting as well so um, but yeah, I mean, one of the things that I've been looking at in lockdown is apart from doing a lot of stitching and designing, um, I've been working out a new website, which is, um, coming out shortly and, um, just trying to master online things really. So I think, um, 
there's always an element where I think <laughs> training as a hand embroiderer, there's probably a large proportion of us that are slightly of the Luddite um, <laughs> kind of uh, persuasion. So I I have both admiration and um, awe of people who are uh, fully au fait with all of the systems on how to make things work online and how to get things up and running. And I've been kind of slowly learning. So it's been... Um, it's been a process for me. So I really love social media um, as a way of engaging with a wide proportion of people. Um, So I've been trying to learn more about that um, and engaging with that, but also um, kind of thinking about how you want, you know, as you move forward, what, what your legacy is. So, you know, I think of all things, people at the moment are thinking about, you know, well, mundane things also, but you know where to get bread. But um, but it's you know people people are thinking more increasingly about, you know, what is it that you leave behind. So I think um, I've been considering that quite a lot as well. I think um, about how that that changes how I move forward, and you know also who you can reach out to during these times because obviously normally when people are taught by me, they come and they are in a physical place. I physically see them so um and that change that obviously working out online changes the way that you can engage so um i've been kind of looking and experimenting with that as well so that's yeah. an interesting kind of change really so it's you know i've been thinking about how that kind of how you embark on that in a way that you maintain your standards and that you the person feels that they're getting um, a connection with you as well so mm-hmm. I think that's one of the things that people want from embroidery it's it's about learning something it's about satisfaction of having a skill moving your skill forward but it's also about that connection right. I think that's really important so I've been kind of experimenting with that whilst we've been mm-hmm. in lockdown so it's been quite a valuable time I mean whilst obviously not ideal <laughs> far from <laughs> right. ideal right. rather stressful on many fronts yeah. um you know it has you have to see it as an opportunity as well it's the way that you engage with anything isn't it it's um it's an opportunity to Mm -hmm. um learn something about myself learn some new skills so um change direction if possible in um in a different way so yeah yeah Yeah, we've been having uh, discussions in more than one show recently about Mm. the online technology and how it's changing and going to change i think long term needlework mm. and, and the way people are instructed and uh, the way they learn, but also access that they have to mm. teachers, designs, schools that would not normally be accessible. And I, I think that there's a real upside long term for needlework just because of this people being forced to continue on with businesses by learning, uh, learning technology and how to do things online I think that will carry out and and end up being a real silver lining out of this thing. I think you're absolutely right. I mean, I think, you know, diversification um, is massively important. Um, And I think I think it is that thing where, um, you know, I've 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 done community work as well, because I think it's important that, you know, people are able to access knowledge affordably as well. So, um, you know, this does mean that you can have a look at the prices that you're paying for something. So, you know, when you come down to the brass tax event, you know, if I'm having to travel somewhere, not only are they having to pay for my cost of tuition, but they're having to within that cost, there has to be my financial costs have to be met. So you know, if I've had to travel somewhere, if I've had to stay somewhere, if I've had to be fed, you know, so those things are taken away when you're working from your studio or working from home you know so it becomes more accessible Mm -hmm. price-wise to a a much broader range of people and um and I think it's been really interesting because the amount of people who've contacted me because they've had a realization at home as well as you know the amount of people who contacted me during this period who have said you know when this is done can you do some beginners things can you do some some things for people who've never picked up a needle before or haven't picked one up in years because I've just realized I don't have a hobby that that either I don't have a hobby or I don't have a hobby I can do indoors because mm-hmm. I'm normally part of a team and I'm outside normally or, you know, it's one of those things. So, you know, 
something that they can do inside the house um so it's been quite an interesting moment i think for everybody to have a real reflection on on what they want to spend their time on and how they want to spend their time and what they normally do and yeah. um and let's yeah. face it there's only so much netflix you can watch right. well that was that was a, a thing a friend of mine uh, who has two teenage daughters uh, mm. posted on some social media somewhere they were setting up a trampoline in the backyard and mm. he said he said the kids have found the end of the internet and now, <laughs> yes. now we have to do something else <laughs> and there's no wizard of oz at the end of right. it it's just it just it comes to a grinding halt, yeah. Yeah, and it's, that's what I that's exactly it. that. Yeah, now what? <laughs> yeah, it's um, it it is, and I think there's when you get to saturation point, and I think it's really interesting that how quickly some people got to saturation point, and how how long it's taken others. You know, everyone everyone's on their own path, and I think it's really fascinating. You know, as I say, as as the weeks and months have progressed, just the sheer amount of people have been kind of like, okay. I'm 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 done with this now. I need something else. Can right. We, can we do this? Can we do that? So, so it's been really interesting, as I say. Um, and and you know, as you know, embroidery is always something. It's a good opportunity to talk. So, um, you know, that opening out of of conversations and even even just, you know, WhatsApp groups or you know, um, messenger groups or groups on Zoom or whatever of students that I've taught over time that. Are sitting at home and that you know they, they've got they've got nobody at home with them and they need need some interaction so yeah. these people are all creating groups with each other so that they can get together and it's like you know they'll sit in stitching company or they'll they'll just even arrange 15 minutes where they'd have you know a tea break like what would be a normal coffee break in a class they'll, mm -hmm. they're getting together and kind of chatting as they would in a normal coffee break and then they're going off on the day another 15 you know they've had 15 minutes out to kind of interact with people in a way that is more normal, you know. So yeah. I think it's I think it's brilliant. I mean, it's make, making us all think, isn't it? So yeah. Oh, it is. Mm. Yes, it it really is. It's making everybody stop. Yep. Mm. So, like good good long term. It's just too bad it has to be such an ugly thing that causes it. It's um, uh, well, this is it. I mean, there's a you know, there's obviously a terrible terrible cost, and I think you know, it it's. But it's only when things are truly so awful that you do have a realization. You do have that moment where you kind of stop and really assess yeah. what you want and what you want to be doing, spending your time with and what's important to you, isn't it? So if everything was slightly more normal, you'd, you'd, you'd still be floating along doing your normal, right. <laughs> normal life. I think actually, yeah, it is, it is absolutely awful. It's scary and these are scary times, but you get out of it what you can don't you so yes. i think it's it's um i had a conversation with my mom towards the start of lockdown and um you know she's she's in her 70s now so she's shielding and um which i don't know if it's a phrase you have there but she's spending time not going out anywhere right. not going outside and and um so we've been doing a shopping and living on a doorstep and things and um you know um it's she was finding it very difficult and so i was having this conversation about the fact that so many arts organizations have put their work online now um and that you can engage with that and that you can control by shielding you can control what you're taking on board mm -hmm. so you can control what you're looking at and how that makes you feel and whether that's depressing and whether you're watching the news every day or whether you're watching you know new wall-to-wall -wall news and looking at how dire it is or whether you're actually creating a bubble of a different kind for yourself, whether you're engaging with all the things that you don't, don't normally have time for. So, you know, the Broadway shows that are on at the moment on online or whether it's films or audio books or, you know, all of the amazing things that, you know, the creative people have put out there, many of which they're doing free of charge. And I think it's just, you know, in that real generous way that, you know, creatives do, um, trying to make things feel a bit better. Yeah. So it's... Yep. Um, I thought it was really interesting because I saw a thing in the newspaper today and it was saying about what is classed as an essential job and what is classed as a non-essential job. Mm. And um, number one, with 71% 70, of the vote of what is non-essential was artist. Oh. And um, and I thought this is interesting because your lovely illustrations in your charts have been created right. by an artist. <laughs> right. Um, right. As has your layout for your quiz. Um, and... I think quite often we misunderstand 
what we mean by artist Mm -hmm. you know and the fact that the creatives are everywhere and they're they've affected everything you see sit on look here you know um, that it's it's all around you and people forget that and i think it impacts everybody's life so so greatly and it's that thing that the things that give you joy in life were made by creatives right um so you know, <laughs> yeah, we, we probably don't probably don't need a Rembrandt right at the moment, but uh, exactly, but artists yeah. artists yeah they're essential right yeah exactly and I think it's really interesting you know people forget that so that the they think creativity is is low on the needed scale don't get me wrong I mean I wouldn't go to I wouldn't go to an embroiderer if I'd got COVID and needed treating <laughs> so, <laughs> right <laughs> exactly you know, I'd go to a doctor for that um, but you know the way that I'm going to get there is in a car that's been designed by somebody. Everything I've got on my back has been designed by somebody and made by somebody. And, and all of the equipment they're going to use has been designed and made by somebody um, who's creative. So right. I think, I think it's that, it's that thing about questioning what a real job is, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Is it a real job? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it is a real job. Very much. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So what uh, what is on the horizon for you? What do people look for to interact with you and learn from you? Um, right. So on the horizon. Um, wow. Well, I mean, there's some nice things I've been doing. Um, I did a lot of projects last year uh, where I went to Norway and was filmed embroidering, recreating a piece, a, a, an embroidered piece from their collection, which is a silk portrait of um, King Christian. Um, and so they asked me to go along because they've created a new super museum there which has combined four of their national museums into one building, one mm. big super building, which is going to be the largest of its type in the Scandinavian region. And they're highlighting, I think I think it's a really interesting project because what they've done is quite often museums and galleries, you see art, but you don't hear about the artist. Mm. Um, and so they're engaging with that making as well as the end product. So they've taken a lot of different fields of different artifacts um, and t- techniques of making and try to create films of people using those skills now, how that's relevant, how it was made in the first place, you know, how that's changed. So they've created these really interesting films to go in the galleries, buy the pieces, but also on their multimedia, on their websites and on their things that they can engage with, people engage with in the gallery. So that will be opening at some point this year, hopefully. And, um, you know, depending on what the impact of COVID has been right. on the making process there, but, um, but yeah, so that will be opening um, and their stuff will be going online um, as will all the, the kind of f- film stuff that I've done for them. Um, other things that I'm going to be doing, I currently do things for shopping channels. So the one that I'm working with at the moment is Hachanda. So um, it's a really good way of getting free tuition um, for people who want to engage with embroidery um, and you can purchase kits through them. But as I say, I do tuition when I'm there. So I'll demonstrate particular techniques and I try to make them different each time I'm there. So um, that's really good. So you can see it on their program if you watch them live or um, it, you can call them back on YouTube. I also quite often put their um, the recordings on my YouTube as well. So it's very easy to find my YouTube. You just search my name, which is Helen McCook. So it's a cook with an MC on the front and um, yeah. And, and, then... and just uh, uh, those videos and we're, we're going to run out of time here and I want to explore that yeah. whole experience with you. So that means you have to come back. So that's how that works. <laughs> not a problem. Not a problem. But uh, uh, yeah, watch those. They're fun to watch. Um, oh, as, as they, I mean, they are as, as a needle worker in terms of, of the instruction you offer, but then yeah. also fun to watch just as a TV show. Um, yeah. yeah yeah we try and make them quite relaxed there's different formats but um yeah some are more formalized some are more relaxed and informal um where you'll kind of have a bit more of a conversational backdrop to what you're doing but yeah mm-hmm. we try and also get some education in there so people can see those skills and learn something each time it's on um and we do try and engage where people you know some of the programs that people can send in questions or ask for advice on things so we try and engage with that as well yes um yeah, so I'm hoping to do a bit more of that solo as well on my YouTube and through my website. As I say, I'm sorting my website at the moment, but people will be able to f- search for that just by searching my name, Helen McCook. My website should then come up. Um, and uh, yeah, so and just ongoing teaching. Um, 
it's, you can find me on Instagram, just all under the same name, or um, Facebook. But I, I put a lot of stuff out there, kind of where it's relevant. Um, but yeah, so moving forward, um, I've been designing and making more kits as well, some more retail kits. It's something I always used to design for classes, um, but now I've started to do the retail kits as well because people have been asking them for them mm-hmm. for years and I've kind of been always so immersed <laughs> in other parts. Um, you know, there's only so many things you can do in a day. Um, right. but, uh, yeah, so I've started to engage with that more as well because it does reach a wider audience yes. uh, in a more immediate way. So, yeah, so that's, that's the type of thing I'm doing at the moment and moving forward, but yeah. And, um, also got a very large project because the Commonwealth games are coming to Birmingham in 2022. So I'm working on a very large um, public community set of textile hangings telling the story of Birmingham as a microcosm of the Commonwealth. So looking at different cultures and people within the city, mm. how that reflects on the wider world. So, um, so yeah, I mean, there's some really exciting things coming up. Yeah. You know, Helen, you're easily the most boring individual I've ever talked to. <laughs> easily. <laughs> oh, I apologize, Gary. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yep. You have to stay interested. The day that you're not interested is, and you're not learning is the day that you may as well curl up and die. That's what yep. I would say. Yeah, good it's, point um, there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> all right, Helen. Thanks so much. That was a blast. Really enjoyed it's hearing been from an absolute all of that. Pleasure. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. Well, enjoyed it. Thanks to everybody for listening, and thanks to the EGA and Sassy Jacks for sponsoring the show. Mm-hmm.